Sandra, welcome to Scenic Root Podcast. Thank, Thank you so you much for much being for here. Me. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so before we start our chat today, full uh, full disclo- full disclosure, I'm a client of Sandra's. Um, she's helping me with well well just feeling better um and like through all of my like chronic health uh, ch- uh issues and journey um and she's quite the different poop lady um she <laughs> i don't know her advice is totally different from mainstream diet uh suggestions and advice and diet tiktoks so i am super excited to have you here Likewise, thank you so much for <laughs> interesting me as well. <laughs> yeah, so that people kind of get to get an idea of who you are. Can you briefly walk us through your story, like how you started, how you got to where you're today? What were the pivotal crossroads, the big moments for you? So to cut a long story short, I mean, he called me the poop lady. <laughs> people are probably going, what? Uh, what do you do? So actually, I'm a clinical dietitian by trade. Um, I have been a clinical dietitian for way over a decade now. Um, it all started off in Australia. So this is where I got all my qualifications. I went to university there. Um a little side note, I'm a very big mix in terms of cultural background. So I was born in Australia because people are probably going, I can't really figure out your accent because mm-hmm. uh, there's probably a little bit of Australian threat in there. But I was born in Australia and I grew up in Dubai in the 80s and 90s. So ba- basically, I grew up in the desert with water and you know, we grew up by the beach. It was beautiful, nice. a simple life. Um, so life was between Australia and Dubai for a very, very long time. Um, born in Australia, in terms of cultural backgrounds, I am Greek Egyptian, uh, so I've got Greek Egyptian blood. Um, so you can imagine what it's like when it comes to family gatherings, where it revolves literally around food all the time, yeah. every time. Loud and oh. food. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I am the daughter of a gastroenterologist. So my dad oh. is a gut specialist. I don't know. I don't know if I told you that. No, I yes. have no dad. <laughs> that makes total sense though. Okay. Right? Now, now so, I'm like, oh. <laughs> people would think I was born in, you know, I was born into this. And um, <laughs> the funny thing is I, I remember a lot of these kind of childhood dinner table conversations growing up revolved, you know, my father on the phone mentioning things like rectal bleeding, anal fissures, peg <laughs> tubes, and we'd be totally fine with that. That's like yeah, a yeah. normal dinner yeah. table talk. I mean, then- that's, but right, like that's good, <laughs> right? Because there's so much stigma around like, I don't know, anything to do with your gut, Absolutely. like Absolutely. pooping and just farts. It's just like mad. Normal and, bodily, you know, physiological functions yes, are yeah, yes. taboo to talk about. And so, I'm yeah, just, so basically that was just the, uh, as, as normal. And then just to see the horror on our friends' faces. And then, you know, my a friend of mine would turn around. She was like, did your father just say anal or rectum? I was like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you it's know, just totally. a biological descriptor. Okay, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically this whole side of... Um, I'm going to call it medicine was mm. extremely appealing and interesting. So that's what I kind of grew up with. Mm. Um, and then obviously this whole side of nutrition was also extremely appealing um, because a big part of my life did revolve around food. You know, we love food. Food is social. Food is, mm. food was, was everything for us. But for me, it was really interesting to see the relationship between medicine and food together mm. and how that works. So I decided to study nutrition and dietetics in Australia, and a lot of my background is just clinical work. So actually, after graduating, I um, worked. One of my first jobs um, was in a mental health center. So basically working with people um, with a variety of, let's say, um, mental health conditions like schizophrenia, eating disorders, um, Mm -hmm. bipolar uh, disease, clinical depression, and so on. And it was really interesting back then, I'm talking this now way over a decade ago, how important nutrition was um, alongside the medical management of these conditions. Um, And then I just went on to working in uh, different areas. So I was on the oncology ward in hospital, so working with cancer patients. And then I decided to move to Dubai en route to Europe. 
I just have to go back to the bar. <laughs> um, just to, you know, go go save up some money. And my plan was to end up in Spain. Um, well, that clearly didn't happen. I'm here in Switzerland 10 years later. But thank God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm here. So a lot of clinical work throughout the years, um, specializing in different areas, but obviously, you know, this whole area of gut health was was central to everything. So I worked in the intensive care unit, but also a lot of people post gut, you know, certain gut surgeries. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended up, um, what was it? I was thinking I was 25. At 25, I was running a whole hospital department, um, a nutrition, di- yeah, the nutrition dietetics hospital department. And actually this is when I had my first burnout at 25. Mm-hmm. And you know, being 25, people, not that they don't take you seriously, but because you are considered young and yeah. you're so cute and small and tiny running a big hospital department, like, what are you doing Look here? at you. Do you want to have a lollipop? Yeah. Exactly. It was, yeah. no, it, it was very much like that. And I think it's just mm-hmm. not about, you know, proving to them that I can do this, but it's probably proving to myself mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, And I would say that moment kind of brought the end of any clinical work or working in hospitals because I just could not do the politics of it all. Mm -hmm. Um, And during that time, I actually started my whole side hustle. So this is where I started off as a blog, you know, started the blog, um, which is Nutrition A to Z now. So that's way over 10 years later. Um, And I called it my side hustle. And the reason why I created that is because I was extremely frustrated with the amount of misinformation that was out there. So my Mm -hmm. whole purpose was to help people navigate this really complicated world of nutrition. And throughout, let's say, months or years of starting it, I started to get, you know, certain project requests to work on some campaigns or, you know, private one-to-one clients wanting to um, have consults with me, et cetera. So that kind of opened up this whole field of, hmm, I could potentially do this. Yeah, it's actually what like I've this. always wanted. Yeah, but it's always what, I mean, I've always worked toward that. I've always wanted to have my own business down the line. This is something I knew, but you have to go through all the hardships and, and all the learnings to get to, to where I am today. So fast forward, um, here I am today after all the clinical work and all this journey based in Switzerland now, the private practice. Um, and we cater to clients literally all over the world from the UK, still the Middle East. We do have clients in Australia. And my main areas obviously of, of specialty is digestive health and disease, um, sports nutrition and eating disorders, as well as corporate health. So based in Switzerland, so I'm not going anywhere now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, the funny thing is also like, although we live really close in terms of like, people listen to this podcast all over the world, we yeah. have never met because we started working uh-huh. during the pandemic. Which, exactly. <laughs> we have always been meeting online, which I don't know, it's funny. But anyway, like we, we started talking about like also how, like you said, like we have to go through all the hardships to kind of like figure out what we want to do with our businesses, how we want to shape them. And it we learn that we have to kind of like trust more on what we want instead of following someone else's blueprint. Absolutely. And really like how we can lead with our with our knowing or with our God, right? Like how we can make it feel like good for us and especially if we if we uh, I don't know I mean I've been through that myself and you probably can relate as with the burnout right like when you push through things you don't you believe you should do but you're not really like "Ah, do I really want to do this there is no joy in it whatsoever you feel like you're pushing through like I'm really want to use this this conversation to kind of like talk to you about like physiological effects like of us pushing through right like the effect on our body on our god and our mind so I I I think I like to use myself as an example because I have had let's say two burnouts and the first one started Mm -hmm. at 25 so at 25 this is where I got diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome IBS yeah um and 
for those who don't know what IBS is, IBS is or irritable bowel syndrome is simply a it's um it's a syndrome, so it's a collection of symptoms um, that simply describe or are a result of a glitch that happens. Um, how do you say? It happens when a glitch occurs between how your mind and your gut communicate. Mm -hmm. Yes. So back in the day, or a lot of people refer to IBS as a functional gut disorder, but now we rename this whole group of conditions to disorders of the gut brain axis, so disorders of how your gut and your brain communicate. Back in the day, the reason why they've actually renamed this is because people used to just throw the diagnosis of IBS left, right, and center. Okay, and so when there was nothing else, this... it was just IBS. Exactly, okay. but it yeah. also undermined the seriousness of it because people, you know, a, a doctor would just say, oh, it's all in your head. And they're actually, yes, it is all in my head, but what do I do? What do I do? Yeah, about but it? Be, because like you have, I mean, I know it. I mean, I have IBS too. Like you have pretty like real symptoms, symptoms. <laughs> that are not just in your head, right? Like, I mean- oh. <laughs> Pushing through. So during that period, my biggest symptoms were um, obviously my gut. Uh, mm. I was going to the loo, so I was um, uh, having diarrhea about 10 to 12 times a day, running back and mm. forth to the loo. It impacted quality, quality of life. I was scared of eating out. Um, I had sleep issues, lack of energy. Um, it was just go, go, go. So my, my day would start at seven o'clock in the morning because um, he had to make it for rounds at 7 30 at mm. the hospital and then sometimes my day just had no end and I would finish by nine o'clock at night and by the time I get back home I'm absolutely exhausted and the last thing I want to do is I just needed to sleep but then I would find it very difficult to fall back asleep mm. so this basically continued for about six months where we're just trying to figure out I mean to come to that diagnosis of IBS you have to um, rule out all the nasties or like rule out more serious conditions. which makes sense Absolutely. So yeah. we've had to go through these whole, you know, bunch of tests and so on. And then when they just could not find anything and have done the scopes, the endoscopies, I remember going to my dad at one point, he was like, look, you're a dietitian, figure yourself out. You know, you can, you know, you know, you can find the answers. Mm. And yeah, I did. So I did doing a lot of research and, and, and not again, it, it's, we're still scratch. I'm not going to say we're still scratching the surface, but I think we're still, we're only starting to see how the mind or how powerful the mind is when it comes to the physiological mm. impact, things mm -hmm. like stress would have on our body. Yeah. So stress is one of the triggers of IBS. Um, and also what's really interesting to see is a lot of people with with depression or anxiety IBS is you know tends to happen or occur in parallel to that too so there's a huge yeah. link, between. Um, link between you know mm -hmm. the gut and the mind there using IBS as an example now when it comes to dealing with things like IBS um, addressing the mind pillar is pivotal and this is what I had to do. So I started, you know, I've dealt with nutrition and I figured out what my triggers were. I was able to, you know, banish the fear of eating out. I was able to refine my balance again and not have to run to the loo 10 to 12 times a day. Um, when it comes, you know, when it came to movement, I figured out forms of movement that I enjoyed. And we'll also talk about maybe movement down the line, but also I, I don't call it exercise anymore. Mm. And then the sleep, um, sleep was also was was very important. But I was maybe back then at twenty five. You know, you, you're not. <laughs> you don't. You can need survive. As much exactly. Sleep. I was gonna say you don't you're need good. as much, and you can really survive on three to four hours of sleep. Totally fine. Yeah, safe. But even when it came to the mind, I had to address that in different forms of therapy, etc. Yeah. So that combination of things, everything started to kind of. Um, look really, really well and promising. And then fast forward to 2018, um, I had another burnout and well, it, it manifested very differently where I started mm. having panic attacks. Um, now, the reason why I'm also mentioning this is because this whole thing of pursuit, not pers pushing through and even I was going to say, the definition of what success is, maybe how society, how we've been programmed to define what success is for us when it comes to whether it's your self-employed or a business owner, um, is very damaging. I mean, here I am, two, you know, two burnouts later. Yep. So 
2018, um, I had my son in 2016. And the reason why I say these are pivotal moments because 2016 is when I decided to have my own private practice. So I was mm -hmm. three months pregnant when I actually opened up my practice here in Switzerland. Um, thinking about it then, I'm like, what the hell were we thinking? Yeah, because I, yeah, same. <laughs> I was I was also like in the midst of I was of kind of like restructuring my business and I joined um, a business mastermind while I was pregnant and then while I gave birth and I was just like yeah I don't know now it really didn't now looking back that was not That's a smart a, idea no. <laughs> but you know and, and this is maybe when, when it comes to like is there actually a right time you know is, is there a, you know obviously it has to be strategic and somehow calculated but yeah so so three months pregnant starting off my own practice so when phoenix was born I'm not going to say there was a sense of urgency to get back into it, but there, there was, I just gave birth to two things, you know, my son, but also mm -hmm. my, my baby or my bit, not say my business, but a physical practice that yeah. needs to build up. So there was this urgency to get back into things. And the kind of person that I was, I'm going to say not now I am, but I was, was this, um, perfectionist or this insatiable thirst, um, to pursue different things i always needed to to feel high busy. achieving for sure very high again it is a double-edged sword but yes that was a recipe for disaster i would say because come 2018 so phoenix was two um not only did I, you know, try to grow the practice, but also I decided to go back to studying because why not? You know, so I decided sure. to enroll. You're in a it. new mom. You have loads exactly. of time. Exactly. <laughs> so I decided to pursue another degree, uh, which is a sports nutrition um, as part of the International Olympic Committee's um, program. And then I, I didn't realize that I was literally... I was pushed over. I was, you know, trying to keep my head above water. So it all started to manifest in panic attacks. And I've never experienced that before. I actually thought it was my asthma playing up. And I went from doctor to doctor, you know, trying to figure out, hold on, what is going on? Uh, went even for, a, how do you say? Uh, I went and even saw a pulmonologist. So just to check, is it actually yeah. my asthma? Long story short, they were like, you're, you're totally fine you're yeah, fine you're totally healthy. it's yeah. just it's just stress it's probably you're under stress I was like this is you know you're undermining this whole yeah. thing it's not just yeah. stress yeah I don't know how many times I heard like just do some yoga well no thanks, but no <laughs> no <laughs> that hasn't so I mean again luckily because I was very well connected when mm. it came to therapists and because I've experienced it in the in the past I didn't Kind of delay things and I took action I took a step yeah. back from work I went back into therapy um and I was in therapy we you know weekly therapy sessions and I'm still in therapy let's say four or five years later and um it was one of the best things that has that I've done and I think through therapy I started to redefine what success means to me through therapy I really became extremely connected mm -hmm. to my own body cues I think mm. what tends to happen with this whole push through or you know soldier on mentality is yeah, that we become completely disconnected mm. and you know going back to the physiological side of things these are real examples of how stress or chronic stress or extreme stress and anxiety can just push us over the edge and manifest in all these different symptoms whether your gut becomes affected whether your breathing becomes affected mm -hmm. and I think you know if we have to look at the physiology of it all the biology of it all um this is the you know when when part of your nervous system this fight or flight response is constantly on edge constantly activated back in the day we always use the exact you know we used to use, mm. use the example that the system is activated when we're trying to run away from any yeah um, there's um, a bear run exactly <laughs> but for us this becomes triggered when it comes to day-to-day -day things like receiving certain emails or certain yeah. conversations that you have on Zoom. yeah or or you have like your phone bleeping the entire time exactly. and you see like oh whatsapp from uh, email from uh, social media uh. 
Yeah. So I remember reading somewhere that we're actually biologically not made for our current um, environment, for our current society. We're, we, our bodies are processing so much information mm-hmm. day in and day out. So the biggest learnings was um, were to start listening. I think to be very much connected you know, understanding my red flags. So I actually mm. knew what my red flags were. I became way more connected, but this is where therapy came in. I was able to create all these tools and learn, I mean, learn all these tools and skills to be um, very mindful of when I'm able to pursue certain things and when I'm able to kind of step back. And it's funny how, again, redefining this whole term of so success. How do, because, show, how do show, like how do red flags show up for you? Like what are your um, biggest stress? Stomach. Like? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stomach migraines, tension, headaches, not being mm. able to sleep. Um, mm. These, as I said, that gut feeling when mm-hmm. I know something's not right, mm. I'm, yeah. I'm very more sensitive to that. Um, I know that I retain a lot of stress in my jaws, for example. Oh, I, yeah. I, you know, the, the jaw, you know, is it, is it tense? Is it relaxed? Um, tension headaches. So my neck and my shoulders, are they too scrunched up closer to my ears? Or are they, you know, mm-hmm. nice and low? Um, and then one thing that I had to put into practice and that actually has helped not only myself, but almost all my clients suffering with gut problems is belly breathing something so simple we call it diaphragmatic breathing but this is actually one of the easiest ways to just reconnect that the whole kind of gut uh, mind connection mm-hmm. is through belly breathing because even the science shows that that can reduce your heart rate that can reduce yeah, it just blood starts pressure. regulating your entire nervous system exactly and this is also t- you know it taps into the other part you know the other um we call the parasympathetic nervous system or the par- is, is your rest and digest. So mm. how to activate that even more. So just the act of breathing or belly breathing, which we tend to forget as adults, especially in this current society, which is extremely fast paced and soldiering on and pushing through. Yes, and, there's and so corn and stone. We become shallow breathers. Mm. So I think for me, what was one of these pivotal moments after the second burnout is realizing or reassessing, okay, what, what does success look like for me? Or how do I want to run my business? And I didn't realize that actually it's not about pushing through or pursuing it's taking a step back. So I, you know, by taking a step back and being strategic with my time and my mm-hmm. energy, and I don't have to be crazy busy to be successful. This is where it's actually quite the opposite, happened. right? Absolutely. But it's interesting that right? we're so like, and that's most, that's mostly because most of us are still employed or have, ex- or had have past experience of being employed where you're getting paid for your time. Yeah. So we have this link of, oh, I get paid for my hours and not really for the value I create or the output or whatever, just for 60 minutes, 42 hours, whatever. Yeah. And that's just, so it's kind of like the more we, so because we know, we know that we kind of like, oh, our head goes, oh, okay. So the more I work, the more I earn, which is like. But it doesn't go that, but even if you if you are even if you are employed, I mean one thing that we've seen, especially with the pandemic, is there was people found it very difficult to create boundaries. Creating boundaries when it came to this whole, you know, so-called work-life balance. I mean, mm-hmm. you're working from home. Well, what's your your life, exactly. Your life and your work just merged. Yeah, I always refer to work life blend because it's the balance thing, I don't know. It's I, I don't, I, to be honest with you, again, even this whole work, work-life work balance, I'm not going to say it's a delusion, but I feel like you <laughs> will need so. to read, it's a you, mirage. Really, you need to redefine what balance means to you, depending on what you are currently going through in life yes. and work. What's the and, season you're in? And... Exactly. Um, and this is another thing that I've learned as well. So it's, it, you know, that this whole pursuit of work-life balance and this whole, also another thing that society sort of, pounds into us is can do you want you know having it all can you have it all and maybe mm. that was also my downfall is wanting it all but it was like you know what no I don't have to do it all and I'm not I don't I don't want to do it and, all and anymore. actually like do you actually want to have it all like that's the thing right mm. like do you actually want to have it all or it's or is it like it's actually I'm actually quite happy with the good enough yeah and 
for for this season that's good enough exactly and, and maybe i don't know when the kids are older or when you feel better physically whatever you can reevaluate your goals and what and your desires and be like yeah actually i, I now i feel like i want to try for for something bigger exactly i i personally now believe that you can have it all but not all at the same time mm. so you just need to be strategic again and this is what this is why i always say i'm very strategic with my time because people ask me like how do you do it all i was like yeah no, you know I, mean, also, I don't you do it all just finished a book <laughs> manuscript so i'm like and you have two little kids so i'm like well sandra how do you do it all it is asking for help i was gonna say yeah. and then i'm mm. probably privileged from that perspective is just having the help and support around knowing what to delegate and when to delegate because of you know in the past I just wanted to do it all and I knew yeah, that was impossible would, would, would say that being was able to delegate exactly it doesn't come easy no and I had to learn people Again, I have been learn. conditioned as women right <laughs> like we're like oh I have to do it my own I have to soldier on I have to be like this you know, being match here all mom, be, oh, being the perfect mom, being the perfect partner, being yeah. a perfect business owner, being and 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 again that was my downfall. And I learned, you know, it, it's 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 I am perfectly imperfect, and that's good enough. But going back to this whole wanting it all, as I said, am I, you know, if I had to speak about my own personal experiences when it comes to let's say this, this specific business, am I taking off all the boxes that I've set? set myself to achieve absolutely but it's been a journey it's definitely been a journey it's definitely come at certain expenses again you do learn the hard way um yeah that's always sometimes say the scenic route hit me over the head repeatedly <laughs> <laughs> like slow down god damn it woman yeah i mean it's how else are we gonna learn I don't know. I, I, I really admire, I mean, I know one or two blessed people who just, I don't know, have already have, even when they were 20, I know them for a long time. Even then they had this scenic root, let's call it scenic root approach. They were just blessed with that wisdom. Yeah. I'm like, that's amazing. And then the big majority of us, we have to learn not once, maybe twice. <laughs> and three times <laughs> three times <laughs> but you didn't burn out three times though no it was two but I, I think as I said I, what I'm learning maybe the third time and maybe it's it's probably this year was another hard learning is taking on too much but I am that type of person I, I think I I'm not going to say my mind needs to constantly be stimulated but when is it enough? I think I'm I'm learning that it, it's okay, you know, it's okay to do two things. It's okay. And that's it. That is good enough. And I'm I'm learning that. But I would say in terms yes. of burnouts, yep, that that was luckily, you know, a, a hard lesson learned, but I'm very more intuitive when it comes to what works for me, what works yeah. for my Knowing business. The telltale signs of like, ooh, Absolutely. okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I remember my, I burned my, I burned out at, I don't know, what was it? 27 or so, I think 28, ooh, give or take. Um, and I didn't, it, it's, it's, e I don't know. It's easier after you've experienced one burnout because you're kind of like, oh, telltale signs. Because I remember the first time, the first burnout, I was I didn't know I was burning out or how bad it was until like, ev like yeah. everything kind of like imploded and just like, oh, okay. Uh, it, okay. I really, uh oh, okay. Bad, 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 bad. Yeah. So yeah, there's actually a lot to learn also from those times where we feel deeply discouraged and afraid and, and anxious and, and shame also, right? Because there's always so much shame attached to burnout. Like, oh, you're not, you're not strong enough. You're not meant for this, whatever, right? Like, no, well, actually. I don't know if it's a sign of weakness, basically. But actually, yeah. I think it's, well, one thing, I, I think, again, at the end of the day, I mean, 
anyone recovering from a burnout and it's not that I want to label it as, as a burnout because also now that whole term burnout is being mm. used so loosely and I know it is becoming which is great I mean people are raising awareness about it but yes we don't even a have a side. strict yeah. medical definition for it um I think as I said it, it's just learning learning your warning signs mm. and What I wanted to say, it's when it comes to recovering from a burnout, what you try to work towards is stress resilience. You're not going to take the stress out of your life. There's no, you know, we we wish we could, but but this is not reality. You cannot control, right? Exactly. It can go everything even well. And then, I don't know, you get a call from from daycare that you have to pick up your kid. Like, I don't know, there's always something, right? It's how do you and how do you how do how you cope more stress resilient exactly it's how, how do you cope and I feel like this whole journey towards recovery is really about learning how to cope and that's the mm. same thing when we're looking at from a you know from from a nutritional or a lifestyle perspective as well the same things apply you know for me I always and you would know this I always ask my clients to reflect about what they want their four pillars to look like, you know, mm. mind, movement, nutrition, and sleep, because I strongly feel that they're all interconnected. If one is off, it's a domino effect. All the other three are going to be off. Mm-hmm. So how do you build a template for your life where somehow all these four in sync? And you need to start working towards the template that you create for yourself based on this four pillar approach and for me actually this is what I'm not going to say keeps me sane but keeps me more balanced or uh, helps me understand mm-hmm. okay which pillar needs a little bit more work mm-hmm. this yeah, time it just around. makes you more mindful of like oh actually like oh maybe it just helps you I don't know classify and structure and be like oh actually yeah. ooh, maybe hmm, have I paid have I been paying attention to sleeping or eating or stimulation joy fun yeah. play like hmm. so I, I started to you know and another thing that also was extremely important as part you know part of this whole journey is is having more fun in our lives mm-hmm. I think again it's yes. just <laughs> yes. what was the last just... fun thing you did the last fun thing I did gosh <laughs> I know, gotcha. Really bad. gotcha. I know. But I know that, so so one of the one of the things that I set for myself this year to do is fun. And for me, fun means dancing. And yeah, I yes. went to what was it, the last music festival that was here? I think it was open air. That was like <laughs> August. <laughs> That's too long ago for something. Yeah. One second. No. Full, dis- full disclosure, I am sleep deprived because my kids have been sick the last few, I know, you know the last hard. few days. But it, again, it's even just finding fun in your day to day life. So I mean, fun. The last fun thing we did was last night. We were just dancing all over the house, and yeah. you know, after dinner, my son, and my daughter were just running around and just being silly and just blasting the music and is I feel like doing more of these little things yeah um is what we should focus on rather yeah. than aim for big fun like you know going to a music yeah, yeah that's the thing I, I always I always say to like uh yeah it's always kind of like my also the clients I work with they're kind of like always waiting for their eat pray love moment I call it <laughs> right like the time when I have like six months of an empty schedule and I do the whole kind of like eat train laughing and I'm like that's awesome but like when it goes when's that gonna happen yeah. <laughs> like when the kids leave house like what <laughs> when they're like, yeah exactly so like how how does eat pray love look like in your everyday life in mm. your schedule and it's not I don't know you deserve more time than I don't know the times when you sit in I don't know you sit in a trauma or in the car when you just, I don't know, crying because you just dropped your kids off or you're sitting on the toilet for longer because it's your time. <laughs> which, which is funny because I, again, a lot of my clients as well, I mean, I always tell them, you know, don't be on the loo for more than five to 10 minutes. I know, maximum. but like, it's actually the time the I have to myself. Time. It's so bad. That's what everyone I know, I know. Says. I know. It's not good for, I don't know, for your entire gut, for hemorrhoids, for everything, but it's like, it's just- It's the, the only time. me time. It is, the, is the, yeah. again, I mean. I once saw this awesome meme, Um, you know, you're a parent when, and it was just a picture of like two naked um legs with like these red elbow marks. 
<laughs> and I'm I like, have got it. Yep. You're, you know, you're a parent because that means you have been sitting on the loo on your phone for 15 exactly. minutes. <laughs> We've all been there. But as I, and, and, and this, this just goes to going back, you know, it's, it's really not about these grand gestures that you yeah. yes, find exactly. those little things in your day-to-day -day life. I know it's easier said than done. Yeah. But this is also something, it's, it's not impossible. I mean, today when I set myself, you know, my happy things to do or fun things to do will be to, you know, walk and, you know, I, I've got a little, a longer break today. So I just want to go for a quick walk because the weather's going to be nice. I want to buy myself some flowers and I want to read a Lovely. chapter. In one of the books. So again, it's these three, again, three is my magic number, but I, I always say set three things in your day for you know, one can be for yourself, one can, you know, if, if people want to go by to-do list, but this is another thing, again, let's not talk about to-do lists, because they can also trigger your fight or flight response, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. but set three things a day. Yeah, that, that are just for the sake of it, and exactly. not for, oh, I do this, so that. And they don't have to be grand, they just need oh, to God, be no. teeny tiny things that make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's so true right like and even like when you do bigger things like I just had like as an example friend and I we ordered tickets um to see Lizzo uh in Zurich yeah. next year she's come to play um so 100% that bitch that goes to see Lizzo and like and today I got a confirmation from the postal service that the tickets have been shipped and I'm like ooh kind of like all that it reminded me of like how we did an impromptu dance party because we ordered the tickets and it's just like kind of like re it was a kind of like a little glimmer that reignited mm -hmm. and reminded me of the joy so it can also be those little things being mindful of that but again we're so focused on the bigger things we're completely again it's just that disconnect of do these little things count or we undermine all these little things yeah and I mean, oh, I get it, right? Like there is so much like economical theory, psychological theory of like rather have one good thing now than two good things later <laughs> or mm -hmm. so. And how do we how do we navigate this? Like our desire or our need for instant gratification that has been cultivated through also through our media use, for yeah. sure. Um, it, how do we navigate our like fabricated desire? Let's call it fabricated desire for immediate gratification and doing teeny tiny steps that we know will accumulate for a long term benefit. How do we navigate this? Oh, I don't have the answer because I'm still learning. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I also don't know, I but we can talk about this, right? Like, because it's, I mean, I know it from myself. It's so hard that you're like, this makes me feel good now, but I know it might not be good for or good for my my health, my well-being, whatever, yeah. but that's tomorrow or in a week or in a month mm -hmm. or whenever I feel the consequences of the actions I took today do we shift our mindset like do we I don't know look it, it's definitely going to be a combination of different things I think mindset mindset is definitely you know a big part of it but also just understanding maybe placing a focus on the consequences even more so like even you know you know this is going to be good for this specific moment but it's not going to be good for later or if it's just a one-off fine not overthinking but I think it just comes down to looking at what sort of habits that provide you with this instant gratification that's short-lived mm -hmm. and you know how do you say weighing up the pros and cons of it if it's a habit that you or if it's something that you end up doing a bit more frequently that might have, how do you say, more negative? Con I, again, I, don't, I really don't like to use yeah, yeah, that yeah. term negative so much, but that is not conducive to your health in the long run, mental health being a part of it too. Um, again, I mean, if, if you want to look at, again, as a dietitian, 
one of the easiest examples to use is comfort eating or emotional eating. And this is, you know, there is a fine line when it, or I would say, you know, comfort eating or emotional eating is a double-edged sword because of course certain foods are going to be comforting and and, and nostalgic mm. and, and who doesn't, you know, like a specific like meal that reminds yeah. exactly. But if that is your only way to cope, for example, if that is your your learned mm. habit, if it's your only way to cope with that or, or your only way to cope with comfort or cope with stress or cope with sadness or whatever it is mm. that you're experiencing, then it becomes problematic. Mm. Again, I don't know if that, that answers the example that creates that that um, resemblance to what we want to talk about. But no, I do. I do feel I, I do think so. Right. Because it's always kind of like shifting the question to why right like why do I need that like why do I need a comfort food today or yeah. why or even in business why do I um feel I need uh, to have Instagram or why do I feel I need to have a certain amount of revenue like it's always kind of like trying to and that's really hard to do on your own. So that's why it's always kind of like helpful to have someone on the outside reflecting Absolutely. it with you. Absolutely. Yeah. But actually looking at, hey, why am I doing the things? Right. And coming from a like a place of I I don't know, I I try my best. I always do the best I can. Then actually looking at, hey, okay, this was the like, and so it's also a thing of like, okay. I had the comfort food. It's okay. I'm fine. Yeah. And not crapping on yourself for it about it. Right. No, but, but, but also again, that takes skill and that takes oh practice God, yes. and support oh from God, other yes. people purely because I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want, for example, my clients to invest so much energy. I'm going to say wasted on this feelings of guilt and shame mm. that comes with these certain actions. Mm. Um, I was right. It happened. There's you know, nothing motivating in shame or guilt. Like if that would work, there no. would be no diet industry because we would all be like exactly. skinny. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work it doesn't at work. all. But I think again, you know, going, you know, go, going back to what were we talking about? I know we keep talking about a lot of things right now, but I, I think <laughs> now we're we all just yeah. Keep, our minds go back and forth, but that's okay because this is a conversation. No, I mean, I feel it's really, I think it's really a good learning to actually, if you start, you're feeling unhappy with certain uh, manifest, with certain things that manifest in your life, whether that be poor sleep, um, poor diet or headache or, or digestion problems or not enough revenue in your business or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Like, looking at okay what do I do why do I do it and can I do things differently Absolutely. and can I, I move forward really without crapping on myself and but I mean, you know what I feel like right? you, need support. Yes. you need support you need people around yeah. you so I again I have my business coach or a mentor. She is, she has been, she has witnessed, you know, she's been with me throughout my whole career. She's the one that had, you know, I had my first job with her and she's been with me throughout this whole process yeah. I have my therapist I have my you know close set of friends yeah. or I would say you know as cliche as it sounds I have my tribe who are more yeah. or less in that same boat that yeah. truly understand these you know the, the the hardships that I would go through whether it's it's a business owner or as a mom or how to yes. yeah I hate the, the whole juggle but how to juggle things or how to navigate this whole area yeah. or trying to you know if I you know how do I redefine what balance means to me right now because I just cannot yes. see it um, I think this is also yes, very important to to have if you do want to work towards let's say defining what success means to you from a professional perspective and a personal perspective as yeah. well 100% um, agree and, so, and, and yeah so then tell me if people would like to have your support how can they do that where can people find you online well they can find me uh by the website <laughs> just google me <laughs> just saying, i'm just google me i'm famous <laughs> i'm googleable well let's wait till the book comes out but um no so i'm reachable on instagram um it's nutrition a to z by sandra McHale. 
Um, the website is nutrition-az.com. Um, so you can reach us there. And just a little story. I actually hate the name Nutrition A to Z, speaking about branding, but it's something that stuck. It was the name of the blog. So that was over 10 years ago, now, 11 or 12 years ago, yeah. 12 years ago now. Um, and the whole, the name came about wanting to cover everything when it comes yeah. to, you know, from, from A to Z. Like, was the exactly. <laughs> when, and, oh my God, let's not talk about that word. But covering A to Z, you know, A to Z, all aspects of nutrition and 12 years on, I'm still stuck with that name because this is how people know me by, or this is how the brands would identify. But yeah, so it's Nutrition A to Z and I am based here in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, but yeah, you can reach out. I don't bite. I am happy to help you out, especially when it comes to poo talk. I definitely, you know, as people say, I make poo talk salon chic. That's like the, the catchphrase. <laughs> Very on, on fashion. Very on style. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're also offering, for everyone listening, you also offer 10% discount on your top selling pro programs. We're going to link them in the show notes. So that's a really yes. good way of like, doing something different if you feel called to do so absolutely and I mean with these two programs well one I, I know you've joined one 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 is really about working with your body and not against it and understanding what works for you yes um, and creating you know even when it comes to this whole world of digestive health and so on it is so confusing and it is a rabbit hole yes. of misinformation yes. especially on tiktok <laughs> Uh, I'm not I'm not on TikTok and I don't know I, I actually so I actually always said I'm too old for TikTok but I must say I find it quite now that I'm have been on it for a while and the algorithm kind of like gets what I like I actually do I don't know dare really? I say it I actually do enjoy TikTok <gasps> I know I I'm, I don't even want to go there I mean I'm still struggling with Instagram the, the, I have the this start was bad the start was bad because it was <laughs> have a giving me all these life. things into my feed where I'm like no 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 dear god no <laughs> um but hey i always have one last question um because i'm um, curious and always need more new material what book are you currently reading i am a sucker for all things light mushy and lovey-dovey novels so ah, right now i'm reading there's a space there's always a space for dad <laughs> um uh reading the return by hold on i have the book here is it nicholas sparks Yes, Nicholas. Okay, yeah, that's Sparks. that's checks he's, all the mushy categories. Right, I was gonna say well, he's a writer of the Notebook, but you know what? But even when it comes to that, I think what's really important is when even when it comes to reading, I need something light, fluffy, and fun and easy oh God, to read. There is time for that. Like, I mean, I I don't know if you if you know her, Jenny Colgan. Yes. I mean, how can you be into chiclet and not know Jenny Colgan? But just like I have read all her books and yes it's always the same plot and mm -hmm. I don't care <laughs> well my other favorite author is Marianne Keys. I don't oh, know if you okay know but yeah. she is actually literally she's she has literally quality like Marianne Keys. I don't know I feel she is a higher, yeah, yeah, literally level. Bet, yeah but still as I said I, I think for me this is also this is my fun yeah. you know th this yes. is my fun for the day and it's something that I've picked up and I was like you know what instead of complaining that I don't have time to read you know what I do yeah. have time to read on public transport instead of scrolling my phone and writing emails I'm reading yeah and it should be something warm funny uplifting I don't know something light and fun and so there you go that's what I'm reading now <laughs> very good very good I also just saw that Jenny Colgan has a new book the Christmas oh, yeah. shop, so I know what I'm going to order next <laughs> Um, oh, it's yeah. actually out today on 27th of October, 2020. Okay, there you there go. There you go, place your order. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sandra, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me on the Scenic Root podcast. It has been a thank blast. Thank you for having thank me. It's so been much. fun. Yay.